Brooke, so, so pumped to have you on the podcast. Um, we met at the, we have, we work in the same industry. And so yes. we met at the Utah fall conference and you told me a little bit about your story then. And it's funny because I got your business card mm -hmm. and I had thought about what you had told me a couple of times because your story is really unique. And I had thought about it because you know, I know that there's other people out there that probably would really benefit from hearing your story. And so I thought about it a couple of times and then I found your business card randomly mm -hmm. a couple of days ago. So I just like sent you an email and, and then now here we are. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've loved this podcast and I've like gotten so much light from the other guests you've had on the podcast. And so when I saw you at that conference, I was like, oh my gosh, I have to reach out to her and tell her how much this podcast has impacted me and how much I love listening to it because I feel like it's just so uplifting and and like you've said previously like there's just so much negativity in the world and like adding to the light that people can receive is just such a great opportunity it's also like as I've been preparing you know for tonight I feel like it's also like I feel a lot of pressure like are people that are listening to this podcast you know in a vulnerable place with their faith and like I feel like that sense of responsibility of like, how can I help these people and how can I communicate my story in a way that's going to uplift and strengthen them? And, you know, if people are, you know, teetering on the edge, like is something that I'm going to say, you know, push them away. It kind of feels like a lot of pressure, but I'm going to do my best to just share my story and I'm going to just be honest and vulnerable about where I am now. I feel like we all have ups and downs and I feel like that's just part of being a saint. And yep you know, what it makes me think of my story in a punchline is like, if you're that cliche, if all your friends jumped off the cliff, would you jump off the cliff? And my whole entire family of origin decided to jump off the cliff of leaving the church all at the same time when I was 18. And I was very much caught up on all of that and had a ton of doubts, but um, just had a lot of experiences that showed me that God cared about me and that I was in the right place. Um, and that being in the church is something that he wanted for me. Was your, when you were growing up, was your family pretty strong in the church? Like what, what did it look like growing up in your testimony? Um, growing up, um, we were all very, very active, very active. My parents are pretty extreme, um, in all of their beliefs and um, they had a lot of extreme views about the church and a lot of extreme views about pretty much everything. <laughs> we were homeschooled, um, well, unschooled for a lot of it and homeschooled for some. And with my dad, um, he had a lot of mental health issues. My mom did as well. And my upbringing was um, pretty unstable, I would say, um, just because there was so much up and down with my parents and what they believed and in, in conspiracies and different th thought patterns and things like that. And I feel like um, something that kind of predicated um, them leaving the church was my dad um, was very authoritative in our home and it was kind of my way or the highway. And he very much used the church um, kind of as a weapon and the priesthood as, you know, I'm in charge of the family, I'm the leader. And so that was pretty unhealthy. Um, but because we were so active, um, you know, we went to church every single Sunday. We did our home teaching. We did visiting teaching and ministering and all of, you know, they always held callings and all of that. So we, I did have a ton of exposure to the church. Um, and I feel like that's something that kind of helped me later in my testimony is I saw all these other active saints and the way that they lived their lives. They spent time in their homes um, especially as a teenager, I had a really close friend group and I spent a lot of time in their homes with their families who were LDS. And I saw just a lot of different patterns of living in the LDS faith. And I knew that was something that I wanted for my family. And I could see that my dad's interpretation of the gospel was not how <laughs> it's intended. So when I was a teenager, I was about 17 um, and I'm one of eight kids um, and I'm third. Um, so I have two older sisters. And then after me, there's um, quite a big gap. Um, and then five more kids down there. So it's almost like two families where there's the three of us girls up top. And then there's like another smaller family, even though we're all 
like biological siblings, same parents. My older sister was married um, and my um, sister that was just older than me was serving a mission in Scotland. And I was a teen. I was um, working, preparing to go on a mission. I always wanted to serve a mission um, that had been a dream of mine since I was a kid. And when the age changed, I was like 16 or 17. And I was like, it's locked in. Like, we're going. I, I learned to speak Spanish because I really wanted to go sp Spanish speaking. I was like, send me to a hut in the middle of nowhere. I will like eat all the crazy food. I will do whatever you want. Like, I'm so ready. And I really wanted to go to South America somewhere. Um, and I was like preparing for my mission. I was 17, 18, turned 18 and um, prepared my papers. And I turned in my papers and I was like just waiting, ready to go. And then um, my mom um, and my dad had been like getting into some doctrines online and they kind of found this fringe group um, that they really, you know, identified with. And then my sister came home from her mission and she like immediately was um, in sync with this group that my parents um, found. Um, and then my oldest sister started to get involved as well. So kind of over the next year. So this fringe group believed a lot of different things and a lot of their practices, you know, anti-Mormon doctrine is, is sinister in that. Um, it kind of sells you on a truth. And then there's this domino effect of if thens, and it kind of sells you like just down the rabbit hole of these things that aren't even really true. Um, and I feel like my family just got sucked into these um, beliefs and a lot of them started out very good. And I feel like that's um, kind of a tactic um, that is used to kind of divert people um, away from the faith. But like what how they first started out was this friend group was like seeking oh, seeking the uh, face of Christ and learning more about Christ and stopping to rely on, you know, leaders and prophets and other individuals to get there. And so that was kind of the message. And this fringe group leader, he had a book and um, all the all a ton of bunch of bunch of different books. And so like, I, I was obviously interested in this. It sounded great. You know, we all love Jesus. So we want to get closer to Jesus. And so I was like, this sounds great. And so I read the book. I thought the book was wonderful. Um, and I was like, this sounds amazing. And so like, I was just like right there with them. Like I was just being fed down the rabbit hole of yeah, you don't need like anyone else. You don't need prophets or you don't need bishops in between, you know, in air quotes, in between you and Revelation. And so I was like very much like all about this, you know, yeah, seeking revelations and um, kind of sign seeking almost like seeking these big, you know, revelations and visions. And um, it's very exciting. You know, it's like, who's going to have the next experience, you know, and I feel like our normal life is just so humdrum, you know, with the way that we receive regular revelation, it's the spirit is a still small voice, you know, and that's not the fireworks that are exciting. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like, wow, these people in this fringe group are having a lot of firework experiences, you know, they're, you know, having all these visions and these spiritual gifts they're talking about. And it was very interesting. And I was very much like going along with it and it's kind of sold down this rabbit hole of, yeah, who needs profits and, and all of that when you can have your own experiences and Did um, they so still, like believe in the book of Mormon and like temples and stuff like that. Oh, or yeah. That oh yeah. Um, mm -hmm. they were like very much like all still within the, the faith and mm. everyone was still LDS. Um, but it was kind of the, they started to break off a little bit. Um, and then, so my family, I grew up in, um, Washington mostly. Um, and we spent a, a year or two in Phoenix and in California, but mostly, uh, Washington, Eastern Washington. And, um, so I was like pursuing this path with them. I was very interested in all of this. 
and my sister came home from her mission. And like, just as a family, we kind of all were very interested in this group because they weren't telling anyone to leave the church. It was just like pursuing more, you know, stop to rely on general conference talks and all that. Just like, it's just between you and God. And I thought that was a great idea. Like, and that's kind of how Satan works. You know, he sells you on this, like, you should have a connection with God, which is true. And then your spirit like resonates with that being true. And then it's like slowly they sell you on one and then they, you know, take you to church basically. <laughs> so I was following along with this and we moved um, down to Utah. Um, as I moved down with my older sister who just got back from her mission and um, we ha had a whole group of these of these members who were pursuing these different um, traditions. And so we started meeting with them regularly, like in their homes and they started doing like sacraments differently, like throughout the week. And then um, I started noticing that like some of the members that were coming and a lot of the members that were coming were starting to say that they were stepping away from the church, but that they were having all of these amazing experiences with God. And, and so it was, I was a little bit confused because I like I had a lot of wonderful experiences in the church as youth and as a kid. And um, I really attribute a lot of my faith to just seeing the good examples um, of saints that I knew. And I knew that I know that it's not everyone ex everyone's experience. And sometimes it's the polar opposite <laughs> that the saints have caused problems in their faith. But for me, like. The saints that I had met and associated with uh, were good, solid, valuable people that I wanted to pattern my life after. And so I was confused by like a lot of the people that I knew kind of stepping away from the church that I loved. And so I was like, well, what is what is really going on here? You know, I was kind of confused. And as we started going to more of them, there just started to be this undercurrent of negativity uh toward the church um but they still were very much focused on christ and focused on renewing um your covenants like they did sacrament in their homes and i thought it was beautiful you know i was like this is wonderful you know you're taking your covenant seriously and and you know although it's like very alternative um it was like they did it i felt like sincerely and they like really believed that like they were coming closer and thinking and pondering about this. So I was like, okay, well, like, I think this is valuable. And these people obviously are having this experience. So I'm going to look into this and just kind of, as I went to more of these meetings, this negativity started to pop up and up and again. And then they started to like introduce different doctrines and some things that kind of raised my eyebrows. Um, but my family was like pretty much all the way into this now. And then like more people were being invited to these meetings. And I was seeing that like a lot of these people that were being invited had been excommunicated from the church or had left the church and removed their records. Um, but I still was, I was believing this, like, and I am not ashamed to admit that. Like I was fully in, then they were talking about rebaptism and, um, just renewing your covenants and renew, recommitting. And I was like, wow, this sounds wonderful. It sounds like a recommitment to God. And so like I participated and I went with my family and we all got rebaptized mm -hmm. um, down in Saratoga. Uh, we went to hot spring and it was a very nice day. I felt good after I had been rebaptized. I felt recommitted. It was different. Um, than the first time I was baptized, but I, I do think it was a nice experience. Like it was a good way to show like, oh, I'm recommitting. And I felt good after I did that. Um, and so I was like, man, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling the spirit. And I'm just continuing down this path with these people. Um, but still, you know, having some reservations because I was seeing that a lot of these were separating from the church. And I had, I just always, when I would come to church and sit in a pew, I felt the spirit. Like I knew that there was the spirit in that building. And so I was um, kind of confused about 
about that situation. I didn't really know how to handle it. And, and I was praying more than I ever had at this time. And I think that also kind of led to my confusion too. Cause I was like, I'm closer to God than I've ever been. I like am seeking answers and praying. It, one of this, this is an interesting topic of discussion because my parents always had this very unequal relationship. It was not an equal partnership where my father, you know, dominated and controlled and everything was his way. And one of the beliefs of this fringe group was um, they believed in an alternative record um, in addition to the Book of Mormon. And they believed that that they were both um, records of the people in the Americas. And one of their records said that there were like the, this council of women would decide who got the priesthood or not. And as my family started to go down this rabbit hole, they started believing that the women like made decisions about who got the priesthood. And all of a sudden, like my parents' marriage became better than it ever had before. And like my dad was treating my mom as an equal partner. This is so hard for me to discuss because what, what do you do in that situation? If you're my mom, you know, the fruits of the spirit are love, joy, peace, and you're going down this road and all of a sudden your whole life turns around and everything starts to get better. And I'm, sh I'm sure that other people have the same experience if they've got a spouse that's, you know, maybe doubting the church and they're fighting or they're resisting, you know, there's all this tension and then they decide to leave the church and all, all of that tension is gone. You know, fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, all of that is returning. What message is that sending to me? And I think that can cause a lot of confusion. So that was what happened with my family. And then they started to believe more and more of these things. You know, they, the women had the priesthood. And I've always like growing up in that household, obviously, gave me some pretty strong opinions about women and feminism and, you know, the situation of the church. And so I was very much all about that. And I was, but I was still very confused about what was my future in the church. And I was praying and praying about, you know, what decision to make because my family then decided that they were going to leave the church. And so my oldest sister and my brother-in-law, all of my brother-in-law's family and then my older sister that was next to me and her husband, well, she had gotten married in that year, they decided to leave. And my parents and by default, you know, my 13 year old brother and the other, you know, ones that were younger than that. So like everyone just decided to just flip the table and make the step and leave. And I wasn't ready to do that. And but I was still very much like sympathetic to all of these beliefs that they had. And I was like praying and praying for this revelation of what I should do. And, you know, cause I had been so confused by all of the conflicting doctrines. And, um, I remember I was standing in my living room and, um, my sister was talking to someone else about how she believed in multiple mortalities and how a loving God could not say that you only get one chance. I remember her saying that, like, you can't have a loving God. And then he just decides that you only get one shot. And if you screw it up, you're done. And I remember her saying that and saying that, like, if you mess it up, you can come back and you can try again and you can do better and better and better the next time. And I remember her saying that. And then, like, clear as day, like... I'm not a very logical person, but like clear as day in my head, I clearly saw, and I feel like it was revelation, absolutely revelation. I just clearly saw in my mind the words like, you don't need Jesus. And that like threw up all of the red flags that I'd been waiting for, you know, because there were these green flags about this, these truths and, you know, these beautiful things that they had been teaching um, but there were a couple like small red flags from different things. Um, but that was the big one that I was just like, if you can come back and you can perfect yourself 
and you can get better every time that you complete immortality, then you reach perfection all on your own and you don't need a savior. You don't need an atonement and you don't need to humble yourself in this life because you can just try it again mm-hmm. if you don't, if it doesn't work. I'd like to be fair to my family, like it did seem like a 180 because I was like in this and then, but like I had these questions and these red flags and then like I had this moment where I was just like, nope, forget all of that. Like this is the red flag that I needed and I'm out basically. <laughs> so like, like I never stopped going to church, but I definitely like wasn't very faithful and like believing that everything I was hearing was true. I was kind of seeing through rose colored glasses at that point. But like, I came back to church and I sat in the pew and I was like, I know that this is the truth. Like, I know that what my family is doing is going the wrong way and I don't want to go that way. And so I just kind of, I, but like, it took me like at least a year coming back to church and saying like, I am committed to this. I know that this is the truth. I was still like at the bottom of the faith. Like my faith level was zero and I needed to regain my testimony of everything um, because I didn't have one anymore, you know, cause I had been your, like, and your whole family is in this other, you know, you separated yourself from your whole family. And I can mm-hmm. imagine that that was really challenging for you to do that. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And th- the next year um, I ended up getting married and you know, decided to go forward with a temple endowment and temple ceiling. And that was an incredible experience. I know that's another thing that people have, you know, sometimes that's a hurdle for people, the temple is, but for me, it was absolutely not like that was confirmation that I needed. I've always loved going to the temple and doing baptisms. And then when I received my endowment, I was just like, this is so beautiful and pure the spirit just washed over me. And I just knew that like I was in the right place. And there was a lot of special things that happened to me to like regain my faith, like step by step. And I really do feel like I had to build it like block by block because like, I remember after coming, coming back, I know I feel like I never really left, but like at the same time, like my mind was a totally different place. And then um, I decided to, to stick with what I knew was the truth and what I knew was solid. And, um, when I came back, I remember like general conference had tickets to general conference for the first time. And I, and, um, we went and they asked us to sustain the province. And I just like took notes because I like didn't even know at that point if I even sustained anyone. I was like, I don't even I can't right now. And like, I can't raise my hand and say that I will, but if I don't know, and I need to be that. And I did, but in the temple, um, I got married the next year and my family all still had recommends because it had been less than two years since they left. So when I got married, they couldn't attend. My mom asked me if she would like, if I would like her, them to attend them all to attend. And that was a lot of pressure (laughs) and I prayed about that, but, um, I eventually just ended up having a conversation with her and I said, well, mom, like, can you honestly answer all the questions that are on the temple recommend interview? And she was like, well, there are loopholes, you know? And I was like, (laughs) I, there are no loopholes. Like it's yes or no. Like, do you believe this? Do you do this? And at this point, like they were all way off the path and drinking and like doing substances and like not keeping their covenants actively leading other people away. And I was like, if you don't feel like you can honestly in good faith answer the temple recommend interview questions, then I don't think you should go. Like if you haven't already been going to the temple and she agreed to that, but then like over the next several years, there was this huge rift because it was like Brooke didn't want us at the wedding. And there was, so it was kind of this big rift and they saw me as like being flaky 
you know, because I was in and then I was out. I paid for that, like with them. There was a lot of relationship building that needed to happen. Um, and it has, it's been a long journey there. I, I'm, I call myself the white sheep of the family because I'm the only one I'm totally, I like for about three or four years, I was like completely ostracized and they would talk very negatively about me and my husband and like just rag on us and stuff. And I was like, like, I'm the one, you know, being good. And none of them are even Christian anymore. They, wow, that's interesting. Yeah, they had a path out of the church um, that was, we're going to be more faithful and we're going to be seeking Christ more. And we're going to, you know, strive. The church isn't challenging enough of uh, us enough. And that really struck a chord with me. I felt in the church that I wasn't challenged enough. And I remember them saying, you know, if you've ever sat in a Sunday school lesson and, and been bored, that's because they're not revealing any new truths and you're just being taught about tithing for the 10th time over again. And I was like, Oh man, like I have so been bored in Sunday school. Like I am absolutely a millennial. I have the attention span of five seconds. Like I get so bored in Sunday school and especially when it's something we know about already and blah, blah, blah. I was sold on that. And that's kind of, Again, the pattern, they sold me on this truth of, I have been bored in Sunday school. You have got me there. And then there's this, if then, and if you're bored in Sunday school, then that means that there's no new revelation. And mm -hmm. those if then statements that they do absolutely sell you down a path that you have to question every single step. Like if I'm bored in Sunday school, does that mean that there's no new revelation? No, that's not true. Like you have to question every, but like when you're talking with individuals that are leaving, they will use these if then statements, but not in an if then way, just they'll say that's because. Yeah. And, and they'll just like logically lay it out for you in a way that seems so to make so much sense. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you're so right. I've been bored in Sunday school and it's been a while since I've heard something new and I have learned about tithing like 10 times and I've paid my tithing fully, you know, and then you get sold this lie that you're not expecting. Mm -hmm. and I feel like coming back into the church, I had a lot of experiences that really showed me that God was looking out for me and ways to strengthen my faith. Um, and that's the first half of my comeback story. The second half of my comeback story happened about, I'd say about two years after my first comeback, I was still like building my testimony. I would say, um, I found an opportunity through just serve to be, um, a rape crisis advocate. And I was volunteering for rape crisis in the evenings and on the weekends. And I was very passionate about that. And then like this big news story broke about like sexual abuse in the church and the church's response to it, I felt was way off. And I was like, it really shook me, you know, and the church is not perfect. You know, we all make mistakes. The general authorities make mistakes and it's okay to admit that and say, we don't have all the answers and we don't, we don't know why. Right. And anyway, this, this story broke and the church's response, I was frustrated by, and it just kind of brought back up all of these issues that I had about women and about the gospel of, you know, and the polygamy and current temple polygamy practices. And, and then I started just those rose colored glasses just came right back on. Mm -hmm. And I was seeing everything through this lens of women are not valued. Women are not valued. And like, I had a major faith wobble. I would say even more major than my first, um, because I was like, this is ridiculous. Like we can't treat women like this. This is, you know, I just got all up in my head about it anyway. Yeah. So I, um, had a long journey to come back to that, but how it started was, you know, I obviously prayed and I was reading my scriptures and studying and 
um, I was, I just couldn't get answers. And I, every time I would go to church, I was frustrated and I would sit in church and all I would hear like in the talks was things about women. Cause all I was listening for was like more confirmation of what I was feeling. And I was very frustrated. So <laughs> I decided to meet with my Bishop. Um, and I had, I was lucky enough to have a great Bishop at the time. I was so frustrated and when I get frustrated, I cry. <laughs> and so yeah. I was like, I know I'm not going to make it through this. If I just go into this meeting and I just like, this is like the 99 things that I'm frustrated with. Like, why don't we have more answers about this? And like, this is so important to so many women that I've talked to and like, blah, blah, blah. And I was all upset. So I decided to write my bishop a letter. And I just, it was honestly so healing just for me to like write down all of the like frustrations that I had and like all of the questions that I had about you know the feminine divine all the questions that I had about temple polygamy all the questions that I had about the sealing ordinances and all of that I wrote it all down and then at the end like the question I I remember the the wording that I left on the end question is like, how am I supposed to find the motivation, the motivation to be good in this life when the church preaches that women are just basically supposed to be glorified baby factories and I have infertility, so I can never experience the joy of womanhood and glorified baby factoring or something like that. I was I was upset. <laughs> and glorified so I, baby factoring. I love that. <laughs> I was upset. Anyway, I came into the meeting and the bishop was like, I really appreciate you writing me that letter. So I really understand where you're at. And I want you to know that you're not alone. And I was like, I was touched by that, but also more angered by that. Cause I was like, well, if it's a problem, run it up the flagpole. You know, why are we talking about it? You know, go talk to the presidents, talk to the area authorities, get us some answers, you know? And he was like, I want you to know that I hear you and that your concerns are valid and that I don't have any answers for you. And I just immediately broke down in tears. And and he shared like a, an experience that he had. He said he served in in Africa on his mission and he was sitting in church and worshiping with these beautiful saints. And he was like, how could a church that I believe in not grant the priesthood and sealing covenants and ordinances to these beautiful saints that I love so much. And a brother in his mission told him about um, the faithful saints in that area before the policy changed that they were allowed to get the priesthood. They would set up chairs outside the building and listen to the hymns through the window. And he was like, I don't, I just, I couldn't understand how God could ever let that happen. And he's like, I don't have all the answers for you on why, you know, these policies are the way that they are currently with women and ceilings and all of that. But he's like, I want you to know that I hear you and I feel your pain. And I understand that it's hard to be in the situation that you're in. Honestly, like I just broke down because I was like, I just needed to hear that from a leader to say like, we don't have all the answers yet, but revelation is coming. You know, like the church doesn't have to be perfect to be true. And like, if you have faith, like I'm sure that more answers are coming. And he said, I've, I've talked to it about it with our stake leaders. I've talked about it with our area presidency. And a lot of women are having this conversation, you know, and having these feelings I feel like I still have this pain, you know, that I still don't understand a lot of things, but I feel like that conversation just totally allowed me to put it back in a box in my head. And I just, that's all I wanted was just like, I need to be able to take these rose colored glasses off and be able to enjoy church without, yeah. <laughs> without hearing this, without seeing this and feel like I'm drowning in it. That major faith wobble really brought me closer to Christ. And luckily this amazing Bishop helped me through that. And like gradually my faith did improve and, and I started to find like the resources and find like my vision changed. And I found like, I truly found like all of the beautiful things about the gospel that 
promote the equality of women and our beautiful role. And I read this article. It's called, I'm a Mormon because I'm a feminist. And it's by Valerie Hudson. And that article really helped me as well, um, as well as a lot of uh, different conference talks and the scriptures, just to get through like this wobble that I had. And like both of these experiences of like coming back um, to the church just really show me that like this is the truth. And Satan tries to get us out by saying that there's more light elsewhere. And when people are leaving the church and I feel like if I could give a piece of advice to anyone who's listening to this podcast, who has a family member or someone like that, who is leaving or has left the church, it would be like, that's between them and the Lord. Like it, you can't do anything to change it probably at this point, because that's their own journey that they're on. But I feel like something you can do is identify they're looking for light and they're finding it in a place outside the church. And that is like, that is what our spirit wants is to find light. And so if you are, if you have a frank conversation with them about I'm honoring your light and, and the light that you're seeking, like, cause I feel like, you know, any major issue that people leave the church over, it's coming from a good place, like in their right. heart. Right. Like, they're not like 99% of people who leave the church are not like, I'm feeling lazy. I don't want to go to church. I want Sundays off in a 10% raise. Like, <laughs> yeah, right. That's not what it is. Right. Like, most of them have like something deep that bothers them and they see like a problem with the church or they see more light outside the church. Say if your friend is struggling with like LGBTQ issues or something like that and they're seeing I'm seeing this pain in this group and I can't imagine a religion that would, you know, ostracize them in this way. They're seeking light. Like that's love that they're feeling for their friend who maybe is gay, you know, like right. they're feeling love and light for that person. And that is a good feeling. Mm -hmm. Like that is not something that you should, you should be discouraging. Having that, that communication. Like, and by not like respecting correct. the they exactly have. exactly yeah yep. like that's gonna push him away more if you're like you shouldn't care about your friend you yeah, know right. like the mm -hmm. church is more important like yeah. that's not gonna build any bridges what's gonna build bridges is you know i see that you really care about your friend and honor that i feel like i feel your pain it would be really hard to have that experience and deal with some of the things that we deal with in the church like, I, I see that you see that you love them. And that's like coming from a very sincere place. And like, I understand that that would be hard. Because I feel like people just want to be heard. Like, when I had that issue with like women's issues in the church, all I needed was to hear was, you're not alone, you're heard, we don't have the answers, but we're working on it. You yeah. know, and that was enough for me. And maybe that's not enough for everyone. But to me, just someone saying like, I hear you, that is hard. That was what I needed. Mm -hmm. And if, if people are having these conversations with their friends and, you know, they see like, oh, you know, you had a, a faith wobble over, you know, this issue. I understand that that is hard. That is a hard problem. And like, I hear you. You know, if I had your same experience, I might be in the same place as you. Mm -hmm. And with my family, I feel like that's very much what I've come to. Like they all decided to jump. Um, but like I haven't, but I haven't had the same experiences as they did. As a youth, I had really solid friends and I hung out with my friends a lot and spent a lot of time in their homes. And I saw really healthy examples of faithful saints. And my older sisters didn't have that. And neither did their husbands. And neither did my parents. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially my older sisters, they never saw like what was healthy. And so if all you have is like our own family of origin, and you have that as your example, I would absolutely leave that too. Like right. that is not healthy. That's right. not a healthy experience. And so I feel like we've kept communication like pretty open about that. And there's not like 
judgment now. I mean, there was after the wedding and the whole, you know, I say you're not invited, but like, I've just asked you to be honest, miscommunication that happened, yeah. all of that. There was some hurt feelings and lots of different miscommunications happened there around the whole incident. And now we're like in a really good place. Like they have their own lives and I respect that. They respect my choices. And I feel like it's just led me to, to see like, you know, this is the life that I want. Like their lives have gone completely different directions, um, completely different directions. And like, especially my younger siblings now who weren't raised LDS, four of them aren't baptized. And the other two like didn't have experiences as teens in the church and their lives are now going completely different directions than my cousins or, you know, anyone else that, you know, is in my ward family that their youth are being raised in the church and going on missions and, you know, getting married in the temple and doing that. Like my family, that's totally different story. But I've seen that, like, this is the path that I want for my life. And they've made their own choices. And there's a lot of respect there that I feel like goes both ways. I've continued to just go to church. And I feel like I've been pretty vulnerable. Um, I've had loons now and, um, I bear my testimony and cause I'm a pretty outspoken person. Um, and I always share it like, you know what, I'm in a rut this week and I prayed and this is what I did to get me out of this rut. Or I've been in a rut for a few months now. You know, I don't, I don't share my testimony every week, but where frequently like I'm in I was in the Relief Society presidency until a few weeks ago and like when I would teach I would share you know hey we all go through ups and downs in our testimony you know and that's okay like the mm-hmm. church is perfect we're not perfect you can tell that the church the church is alive right the church yeah. is living it's a living gospel and like if you take like a house plant how can you tell that a plant is alive versus a fake the alive one will have like a little brown spot or like it'll have a dead leaf or, you know, like Mm -hmm. there's going to be imperfections in anything that's alive and growing and living. Like Mm -hmm. it's just the fact of life. We're all human. We all make mistakes and the church is alive. And, you know, Jesus Christ has died so that we all have one chance. (laughs) We only get one shot, but -hmm. it's because we have a savior who died to make up for all of our imperfections. He died to make up for all of the imperfections in the church and all of the imperfections in church doctrine in all of the imperfections in whatever we're, we're dealing with, with, you know, leaders who have broken our trust or, yeah, you know, anyone who's gotten in our way or any kind of other, you know, misgiving we may have. He died to understand all of that pain and he understands everything that we're going through. This church, I can truly testify that the most light can be found here. There's struggles, there's trials, definitely, 100%. You're going to get that elsewhere too. If you're going to leave, where are you going to go? You know, are you going to go to somewhere that's going to bring you more light? And are you sure about that? Because, like, my family, they were sure that they were leaving to somewhere that was better and, you Mm -hmm. know, a promised land of more fireworks and closer to Jesus. And they've completely left and none of them are Christian. They're atheist and they don't believe in, in even a higher power. If you're seriously considering leaving or seeking light elsewhere, just like, is that going to, is that truly going to bring the most light? And are you sure it's perfect? (laughs) You know, like everything's going to have imperfections. And yep. we can't we can't guarantee that the church is ever going to be perfect in our lifetime or that we're ever going to have the results or the revelation that we want to mm-hmm. answer every question that we have. Right. You know? Right. That is so you are so right on with that. It's like, I don't know, like I just I haven't really like thought of it that way that if you're leaving, are you going somewhere that's going to be totally perfect? Like nowhere you can go. It's right. going to be perfect. And that is such a good point. And I, I also love that you were talking about how it's okay for us to talk about our struggles and stuff. Like, I think that 
faith crisis. And I love that you said a faith wobble. That is like the best <laughs> description. I think by talking about faith wobbles, it's almost like we're afraid because we don't want other people to think that we are lacking in faith or right. you know, we don't want to we don't want to like go into the the details of stuff because of what we're struggling with. Yeah. Right. Like the, when my Bishop said like, you're not alone. I, like, I know that my own wife struggles with this and like other people struggle with, I was like, how have I never heard this before? Like yeah. I have never, never heard of someone struggling with these issues because everyone's just keeping it quiet and we're all right. just struggling. And like, I feel like I was asking for like revelation to be handed down to me on a silver platter mm -hmm. of like, please give me all the answers to my questions that I want just yeah. right now. And like, I remember when I was studying about those women's issues, like I was studying um, polygamy and when I was studying about the pioneers and like when they were asked to participate in, in polygamy and the, like I was reading an account of one of the women who had to participate in polygamy and she prayed and fasted for like weeks to get this answer. I've prayed about it, you know, several times, but, and I fasted once or twice, but like, I'm just waiting for this light beam to open and give me the answer that I want. And that's not how revelation works. You know, mm -hmm. it's not going to be, any it's not going to appear to me. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and, you know, with um, polygamy and, and these other, these other, you know, questions that we have, it's not, there usually is not like, here's the answer handed to yep. you on a silver platter. Yep. Like that's usually not how it happens. No. You know, really? it usually comes through small and simple things. That's how I, it restored my faith. You know, when I had that initial conversation with my Bishop, it put it back in a box for me, which was good. And then slowly I was able to like rebuild my faith and step-by-step step get an answer upon line upon line instead of yep. like this big aha moment that I was looking for. Yep. It never happened. And <laughs> yes. And I have to tell you that it's so interesting that you talk about this because I had a really similar, um, faith wobble when mm -hmm. I was reading the saints book and I read mm -hmm. something about polygamy in the saints book that just totally was threw me off. And my little sister said she had just got home from her mission. So her, like, you know, textbook answer is why don't you pray about it? And so I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to pray about it. And I'm going to ask God what, what he mm -hmm. has to say about this. And I was talking to my dad about it. And my dad, essentially, he brought out one of my great, great, great grandmother's journals who practiced polygamy and her oh, whole description of when the manifesto came out and they said to not practice anymore. And she was like, why would they tell us we just changed our whole life? Like, and now they're telling us not to do it anymore. And then she describes her personal spiritual experience of when she, it was a spiritual confirmation and she knew that it was right. And mm -hmm. that it was, and so it's like, here we are in the year 2023 and we just like, we can't wrap our brains around polygamy. And I just think mm -hmm. about the early saints and like how they were actually the ones that had to like do it. And, right. and the, the spiritual experiences they must've had confirming to them that this is what God had asked them to do. And anyway, what I was getting at is that I come after reading that and talking to my dad, I saw the entire thing with new eyes, like new eyes. What? I don't know all the details. Like maybe this happened because of this. Like how the heck am I supposed to know? I'm like looking at this with my 2023 eyes. I have no. <laughs> yeah, here of absolutely. And, and your you know, framework. And, yes. And it's funny because what you just said about how you felt okay after that that would not satisfy a critic online of the church. That would Absolutely. not satisfy them. They would say, oh, like, but for you, you know that that was, that was solved for you in your heart. And yeah, and like, and like, I'll be honest, like, it's still a question that I have. Like, it right. still hasn't been answered. It's still like 23, 2023 minds, like still are like, what is going on with that? We yeah. don't understand that. I had the faith to be like, you know what? I'm going to get an answer to that later. And no one has asked me to have a testimony of it. 
Right. Like when I go in to get my temple recommend interview, they don't ask, do you have a testimony of polygamy? Like yep. that's not a question that they ask. So like, I'm just like, you know what? The, the questions that I need answered is God real. If I pray about that, I'll get an answer to that. And I'll feel that in my heart. Like, and all of these other questions, you know, when Nephi was bound and he prayed, he said, release these bands that I may lead this people. You know, he had something that he needed to accomplish. And I feel like that's a pattern that we can use when we're seeking revelation. Why am I seeking this revelation? What am I, what do I need to accomplish? Like, oh, I'm a mom and I need to know how to teach my children. Heavenly Father, bless me with this revelation so that I know what to say. And like in the answer, if in if you ask it in that way, you will get an answer. Like, mm -hmm. but like nowhere does it say you're required to have a testimony of polygamy. Yeah. To have a testimony that that current sealing practices are are the way that they like any question that I struggle with, I just ask myself, is this I need to know, or is it like I'm struggling? I'll get an answer later. I just came to realize, you know what? We don't have all the answers and then that's okay. Yep. You know, the church is growing, it's living, it's breathing, you know, it's a living organism and it, it's going to have brown spots and failures. And mm -hmm. that's how you know it's true and that it's alive. I love and that. that Christ is alive in it. Mm -hmm. I love that analogy so much. And I think that, I don't know, this whole thing has just been so good. Like so, <laughs> many, so many nuggets. I, I find it interesting because every time we have an episode, somebody will message me and say that episode was just for me. That episode was just for me. You, I'm going through this and it was exactly what that person just said. And so I know that somebody out here is listening to this episode thinking, oh my gosh, I am so grateful that Brooke just shared her story because this is exactly what I needed to hear. So, yeah. And I hope that if they are listening, that they see that as one of the lines in the line upon line, precept upon precept, like that is one of the lines, you know, it's not going to be a giant beam of light, a spotlight yeah. from heaven that answers a question. Like they're going to have small and tender mercies that are going to answer their questions this line upon line. And I know that, I know that like, and a lot of times we think, I hear other people hear this voice in their head or like read this scripture and it just pops out at them or something. But like, sometimes it's just those small experiences that we have, like someone might say something or you might find a podcast or you might, you know, hear a testimony that touches you and just reaffirms to you that like Jesus loves you and that he's thinking of you and that your question is not small to him mm -hmm. and that he understands your pain other people have the same questions as you and you're not alone and just all of those things it's line upon line. It really is. And if they're praying for a big revelation, maybe they just need to realize that it'll just come slowly. Like, cause both of the times that I had, you know, faith crises or faith wobbles, like it wasn't like it was, I slowly had to rebuild. Like mm -hmm. was in that low place of like, I still want to believe it's true. And I still feel like that I want to be here and that I feel the spirit here. Like, but I need to rebuild slowly. And like, I hope that they just find a block in their brick wall, you know, by listening. And I'm hope I'm hoping that I touch someone. I'm sorry if I ranted, but like, I was, yes. <laughs> if anyone, it was me. So. <laughs> I know that like when I was searching for answers to these questions, I was looking for other people who had struggled and overcome it. Yeah. 100%. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for being so open about your story because that is not, it's not easy. And um, you're just amazing. So thank you <laughs> so much. Thank you for having me. It's truly been a joy. And I hope that I've said something um, that will cause somebody to pray and, and get a little more light and find that the light truly is in this church and Jesus Christ, in this gospel, in the temple in all the beautiful covenants and ceilings and all the beautiful practices that we have in our faith, in our garments, in our 
teachings in our Relief Society lessons on tithing, on Mm -hmm. everything. I hope that they just see the beauty and the joy and the light that is in this church. Love that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yes.